Well, good morning. We're grateful for the Lord's presence here this morning, and that is the promise that we're given in John 17, uh, that He is going to endear us to the Father, that Jesus is endearing us, His disciples, to the Father. And uh, we are found in Him, and He is found in us, and there's just this mysterious and wonderful relationship that exists there that, that we can examine today. <clears throat> the place that we're going to, to end up is, is really we're going to center around the word consecrate. You can also use <clears throat> the word um, sanctify, uh, to make holy. These concepts all string together, and <clears throat> so you're going to find them interchangeably, but what it means is to take something that is, might be unnoticed, might be for you know, daily use, is uh, inane or in a neutral sense is, is just uh, for common use. Um, and, and then you take that thing and you set it aside for a special purpose. And so we're going to see how Jesus is preparing that, that very thing for his disciples, for us as his followers. And so let's start off here by praying, and then we're going to jump into John 17. Lord God, I just thank you that you have included us in the conversation, or that you have brought us into uh, your throne room, you brought us into your presence, and Lord, that um, you are here with us today, and that we can speak with you and speak to you and hear you speak to us. Lord, I just pray that uh, you would do a work in our hearts this morning as we consider, Lord, how you just pleaded with the Father. Lord, you, you even proclaimed, Lord, that these things would be true, um, and that you would do the work that you would take care of uh, every detail that needs to be taken care of so that we might have relationship with you eternally. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, let's turn to John 17, verses 14 through 19 for this morning. And while we are searching for that in our Bibles, I, am, I noticed as I was reading through you know, what is the point of, of Jesus? Everybody kind of is going to be shocked. But what is the point of Jesus praying? Okay, well, he's human. He's existing on this plane. You know, apart from where God is dimensionally, there is a separation of sorts between them. So there is communication, right? So that's, that's kind of important. But why is Jesus saying this in front of his disciples? Why is he praying this? And I believe that any conversation that's held between two people um, you know, is, is something that, that maybe you want to hear. You know, any conversation that involves you, especially, is something you might want to hear about. And so that is what Jesus is doing. So there's some intentional eavesdropping on, on the part of his disciples and us. We benefit from that. So go into this scripture just understanding that we're eavesdropping on that conversation between Jesus and the Father, and it's quite intentional. So here we go, John 17, 14 through 19. I've given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself, that they, may, they also may be consecrated in truth. So like I was saying, we are getting a moment in history, one of the most sacred moments in history where Jesus appeals to the Father 
and really peels back their plan that they have set out from the foundation of the world to bring humans close to God. They have set out this plan from the foundation of the world knowing that there was going to be this rebellion against God in our own hearts, in our own lives, that we will actively disobey him. And so they have, from the beginning, never surprised, they have been ready to unfold this plan. And so Jesus is appealing to the Father at this point. And really what he's doing is, as he's praying, as he's having this conversation, he is revealing to his disciples and us as his disciples what his heart is and what his plan is. And as we're preparing ourselves for our fall series, which will take place in Hebrews, we're going to be walking through the first several chapters of Hebrews in our fall study and with our life groups. And I was reading these verses with our, with our pastors as we were discussing this coming series. And from Hebrews 1, 3 through 4, it says, He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the, po- by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. And so what we're seeing here is is Jesus is praying in John 17. And he says some things about word and truth. He says, um, sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. And now we look at Hebrews 3, after making purification for sins, after the sacrifice has been made so that sins can be forgiven, so that they can be removed, and that there is no longer an offense and a barrier between God and man. After this has happened, after Jesus had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And we look at this, it says, he upholds the universe by the word of his power. And so this is a very curious thing. And you look at this prayer, you look at these these concepts that we see, especially in, in the Gospel of John. For instance, at the beginning of John, we see, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And it moves on from there, continually using this concept of the word and the the concept is, is actually, you'll see that it's something echoed. John was, was very aware of some of the things that were happening in Genesis. We see that he is using some of the language and he's borrowing it from, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And what did he do? He spoke things into being. So John is really intentional at the beginning of his gospel to say that Jesus is his express and final creation. You know, it's, it's kind of mind-blowing to see what those concepts are really communicating to us. And so there is a, a word, the word, and there is truth. And so these two concepts just hang together throughout Scripture, especially in the, the New Testament. But these concepts hang together. And so... When we take a look at this, we see things like, um, you know, your word is truth. We look at a phrase like that, and, and I think oftentimes we think to ourselves, well, you know, it's talking about the Bible, and that is not incorrect. That is what it is talking about. It's what God can accomplish through his word, through the thoughts which is the word, and then what he manifests and makes reality by speaking things into being. And these are the concepts that, that John's actually dealing with. He's saying, yes, this, is, this has been the tool that's been given to us. And let me just say a couple of words about this. You know, um, we, can, we can understand and we can grasp you know, what, what words are in here, what uh, where, where things are. 
and, uh, and, the, and the things that, that relate to one another, the stories that relate to concepts and concepts that relate to concepts, and all those things, we can, we can get all of that. You know, what's interesting about a set of keys is I could sit here and just memorize, well, I've got a master key for the church and it has a number five on it. And then I have an office key and it says 108. They're kind of like this uh, pair, uh, polygon shape and uh, you know it's um, then I move on to you know this square looking one that I don't actually remember what this is for <laughs> and it's like that sometimes <clears throat> and then this round one and then I got this cool little keychain of Charlotte Amelie I think I said that right from a vacation to St. Thomas and uh, you know I can look at this and I can see the different things that that I uh, that I actually experienced, you know, my family and I, we actually experienced that. Now, if I, if I take those keys and, and I just walk around with them and I, I know what they look like, I know what they're for, but then I never actually utilize them, they're kind of useless to me, more or less. And, and I think the, the Bible is like that for us. You know, it, it is, if you'll just follow me down this comparison and, and this metaphor, is that it unlocks the mind, the heart, and the expressed will of God for this world and for our own lives. And so it is included in the concept of the word and the truth because these are God's thoughts that have been communicated to us and we use this as our tool for, uh, you can make all kinds of analogies, but we use this as our tool for really seeing God's heart and his mind. Now, this prayer that Jesus is praying, you know, this is not a, like a I hope so sort of prayer. And I think a lot of our prayers exist in that territory is like, Ugh, I hope this happens or I hope that happens or please make this happen or not. Now, this is a different sort of prayer. While he is asking the Father to do this, he understands, has faith in his Father, understands him that he is able to do exactly what Jesus is asking him to do. <clears throat> These are more of agreements and statements. And I think that's a really good example of what we're going to see later. We pray in the Spirit. You know, we pray according to God's will. And these are the kinds of prayers is that when we understand the heart of God, when we understand what his desire is, we can make statements like this in our prayers knowing that, that God desires to do that and that he is mighty enough, he is powerful enough to accomplish what we're asking. Uh, and, and so again, it's, it's this understanding like how I am far from God Jesus has created a bridge. He has created a way for me to come to him by making these, this, this accommodation. He's making this way through, as it says here, that he made purification for sins. And he's sitting at the right hand of God, and he's, it says that right now, you know, he's making intercession for us. And he has done this to accomplish something. He's, he said, you're going to stay here, but I'm going to do something for you um, that you will benefit from. So let's keep moving on. And we see that God's word is powerful. You know, the word and truth. These, this word is, is his ideas, his mind. And they're spoken into reality. That was... That's what we could say about truth, that it is God's expressed reality and as opposed to some sort of illusion or some sort of even uh, just fabrication or even a half-truth. What God expresses is reality and is, in fact, truth. So he creates reality. He is the author of life. He is the author of everything that we witness and uh, and so when you think of 
these words truth, you think of these word, this word, uh, word, is that put them in the context of what God is thinking and then what God is enacting. He creates reality. Now, he says something really important for us to pay attention to. He says, I do not ask that you take them out of the world. So he's not just pulling the plug and, you know, we get to jump out the escape hatch. He's saying, I want you to keep them here. And, and again, I think this is a statement that the disciples need to hear, that we need to hear, that there is an important thing for us to accomplish here. And he outlines that, you know, at the end of, of Matthew, we see the Great Commission. There's a mission for us to fulfill. There's things for us to accomplish. There's the, the maturity and, and the growth of the church, all of these things so that people can come into the family of God, so that people can experience relationship. He wants us to stay here. But while we're here doing all of those things, he's given us a way to stay safe. So, what does he say here? You keep them from the evil one. And when you look at that, this, in the original language, you could say keep them from the evil, or you could say keep them from the evil one. And I think that, that really is, there's, there's two parts to this. And we have to understand that the we are capable in and of ourselves of rebellion. But there is also the original rebel. There is an actual enemy of God. We call him Satan, right? He is the accuser. And it doesn't just include one guy, it includes a whole host of rebellious and satanic angels. And so this, this concept of, of Satan is really about somebody who stands against, somebody who is an accuser of us, the brethren, and is also a mocker of God. So he is the original rebel. And what God is saying, I, Lord, Father, keep them safe from this evil one, this evil being. Keep them safe from that kind of evil, from that depth of depravity and rebellion. Keep them from that. So this is what we, we commonly think of, well, kept safe. Well, you know, I, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't want anybody to steal my stuff. Um, I don't want anybody to hurt me or my family. Well, he says in 15, he says, the world has hated them. We know the implication of this. We know that throughout the world that there is tremendous persecution going on of, of people who claim the name of Jesus, people who believe in his name. These people are maligned. These people are shunned. These people are even put to death. So he's not really talking about physical safety. But he's talking about real safety. What God really wants to do is to keep us from evil. It's to keep us from that sort of rebellion and to, be to keep us from being tempted by the one who is the original rebel. And he says in Matthew 10, 28, Jesus says, And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Is what Jesus is saying. He's saying there's, there's a lot more beyond the physical that we need to be concerned about when it comes to our safety. And then, if you consider our own propensity for rebellion, our own propensity for uh, indulging our lusts, our own corruption... You know, the, the Bible says that we have hearts that are deceitful and desperately wicked. So that's true. I mean, there is, there is a desire in each one of us to fulfill our own needs, our own wants. And when we indulge in that, 
we will go to great lengths hurting our relationship with God and hurting the other people around us. So we know that that corruption and that propensity, that, that tendency is there for us. It exists in us when we're born. And the great tragedy is, is that when our hearts are in that condition, they're unbelieving hearts. And that really is the most dangerous place to be. And we see that in Hebrews 3.12. It says, Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. That is the most offensive thing to God is when we don't believe him. And you see throughout the Old Testament, you see through the New Testament that reiterated his relationship with the people of Israel. And in Hebrews, this really gets brought to the surface, into the spotlight. And we see that over and over again, they just wouldn't believe. They had stiff necks. They had hard hearts. They wouldn't believe God. And so the most dangerous thing that we can do is not believe God. And the safest thing that we can do is believe God and trust him. Now, there's something that I referred to earlier. We, we do have an enemy as believers in Jesus. We do have an enemy. And he's not equal with God. He does not have the same power. He does not have the same knowledge. He does not have the same presence. The prince of darkness, the one that has become known as Satan, capital S, and all of the other rebellious angels, they can only exist in one place at one time. They don't have access to all knowledge. They've been around for a while, so they know a lot of stuff. Uh, I don't know if they sleep or they eat. I don't think so, or that they need to. So the adversary that we're up against is way out of our league, but absolutely just infinitely less than God. So we have to get that clear. That's why it's so dangerous for anyone to not believe God. And when we do believe him, we're given one covering and we're given safety in Jesus Christ. And then we are not susceptible, we are not vulnerable when we're in Christ to the work of Satan. So, what have we been given? You know, what did God provide for us, you know, to keep us safe from the evil one? Well, we're going to go to Ephesians 6, and we're going to do just a, a brief overview of the armor of God, what he has provided for us. And then we're going to talk about how it's been provided for us and how we get it. And what are we going to do with it? <clears throat> All right, Ephesians 6, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand the evil in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end... Keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me, 
that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may boldly declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Jesus is the source for this. Jesus is the one who provides this. Jesus, and when he had made provision or when he had made the sacrifice for sin, it provided for us not just relationship, but provided for us everything that we need to have a life of godliness and to enjoy close relationship with him and also take part in, in the battle that he's, he's called us to. And so this whole concept of, you know, I want you to keep them in the world. Father, keep them in the world to accomplish this. And in the process, we are going to see this marvelous display of, of your power through them. And so Jesus is the source for this. Jesus is the one who makes this possible. It says that in Hebrews 1, remember, it says, he upholds the universe by the word of his power. And after making purification for sin, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. I mean, these are powerful terms, powerful pictures of what God has accomplished. And so, again, we see that concept of his word and the power that's contained in it. He upholds all things, everything that is reality, he upholds it with the word of his power. And this original word, dunamis, is something that, that shows up for us as believers, that this same sort of power that he uses to hold all things together in the universe, all things are in reality, this power he's given to us. But first, there's steps that need to be made. He needed to make purification for sins, and this one just really hit me as we were looking at it. It intentionally says he made purification for sins, that his sacrifice accomplished something that nothing else could accomplish. And purification for sins is of the utmost importance because there can't be any redemption. There can't be any restoration of relationship unless that happens. So we see that when there is relationship, because of what Jesus did, he provides something for us. The word of his power creates something for us. And so in John 20, what happens? We see Jesus giving them this power. And when he said this in John 20, 2022, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, they were worried about their physical safety, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. And I think maybe some of you remember Pastor Tim preached several months ago about Jesus speaking this to them. When he says, Peace be with you, he's intimating, he's, he's telling them, This peace is my presence. My presence is your peace. When he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. He had, he had already made purification for sins at this point. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. John 17 to John 20, he's just reiterating, Hey, I've told you this already. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. You know, these word plays are not on accident. You know, these, these concepts, when Jesus is saying, you know, his, his word, your word is truth. And when we see it, again, reflected when he speaks to them and he breathes on them, it's, he is speaking into reality this new relationship that they are going to experience 
with the Holy Spirit, with God's Spirit. And, and we don't have time to get into this today, but God's Spirit is often spoke of as his word or the wind from his mouth. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of correlations there. And so his Spirit, who is a person, his Holy Spirit, who is a person, is given to his disciples. Now we see this in... in uh, so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you restore the kingdom to Israel? So as Jesus is in Acts, we see him preparing to take off. You know, he's, he's getting ready to go. And so they're concerned. They're like, when is the time when you'll restore your kingdom? Because they were expecting him to do that. They were expecting that sort of physical kingdom. They were expecting him to keep them physically safe, to be their king, to provide protection for them. Well, now he's died and risen again. Now, now the disciples are wondering, well, okay, so you know, this is, this is follow Jesus 2.0. Now what? Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? I mean, come on. He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power, dunamis, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witness, witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So, through the purification for sins and the consecration, the, the setting aside of, of people, Jesus set himself aside to make purifications for sins, and then he set aside people. He made them holy. He made them acceptable for God's presence. He made it possible for them to exist in relationship with him. And not just any relationship, but this infilling of God's Holy Spirit in their lives. He's given them that power. And now, when we take a look at our response to that, we're going to use that word sanctify yet again. So the Father, he has sanctified, he has set apart Jesus. Jesus has set himself apart. And then he's asking them, he's asking the Father to set apart these people. Well then later, after we have received the Holy Spirit, we're told to set apart Jesus as Lord in our hearts. Peter tells the churches that he's writing to, he says, sanctify Jesus as Lord in your hearts. And I don't really have a very good concept of what it is to be serving a Lord, to serve somebody who I am completely depending on for all of my safety, all of my well-being, uh, my, maybe my income, my food, my family's safety, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I don't have a good concept of that in the physical. We've got just this wonderful system here in the U.S., right? But it's so different from the concept of a Lord. But while in the physical I don't have a good example for that, I'm actually living in a kingdom that has a Lord who provides everything. Whether we acknowledge it or not, he is providing everything. And that's, <clears throat> that's what this word implies. Set, sanctify or set apart Jesus as Lord in your hearts. Let me read that one more time. But in your hearts, honor, the ESV says, set apart, sanctify, Christ the Lord as holy always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience so that you may, so that when you are slandered, those who revile you, your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. And we see again, this is, this is a purpose, and this is where we get back into the armor of God. Okay, so we read through that. Jesus is the source of, for all of these things, and we've been asked to equip ourselves with these different pieces of armor, right? 
And what we have said is that Jesus is the source of all this. So that when we set Jesus aside, when we set him as Lord in our hearts, he provides everything that we need for this mission that we've been asked to go out and accomplish. You know, to be ready. And that's what we see in Ephesians as well, is that we've been equipped with these, with these shoes, it says, the readiness to share the gospel of peace. Now, that's not going to happen. Those things, that mission is not going to be accomplished if I don't do this thing, if I don't set apart Jesus as Lord in my heart. I've even felt it from time to time, and I bet you several of you have too. It's like, I am not setting Jesus apart. I am not putting him in that place of um, attention and focus and absolute adoration in my life. And I have felt the effects of that and not been ready to answer somebody adequately for the hope that's in me. Now, can I regain some, you know, some balance and come back later? Yeah, that's, that's true. But what I, am, what I am keenly aware of is that this concept of, of setting apart has been done for us. You know, we believe in Jesus and we are made holy. We are set apart. Now, it's on us to set apart Jesus, to set apart Jesus as Lord in our hearts. And so it's, it's such a, an incredible uh, transition, you know, to know that, okay, you know, Jesus has, has provided all of these things for me. And while I'm tempted to think to myself, oh, I need to figure out how to do all of these things. I need to figure out how to put on this piece of armor. I need to figure out how to have, you know, this fruit of the Spirit. What is comforting is that the Holy Spirit allows for us to understand and to follow Jesus simply by focusing on Jesus as Lord. Um, he has given us kind of like this, this revelation. <clears throat> and I think we'll see that, uh, that Thomas tends to get a bad rap. So when there was this giving of the Holy Spirit... You know, Jesus in John 20 gives him the Holy Spirit. And Thomas wasn't there. He wasn't there at the time. He wasn't there when Jesus spoke and breathed the Spirit onto them and into them. So, what does Thomas do? He shows up after everybody's like, we've seen the Lord. He showed up. You weren't there. I don't know what he was doing. And Thomas says, unless I see his hands, the mark of the nails and the place my finger and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hands into his side I will never believe oh thomas 8 days later his disciples were inside again and thomas was with them although the door, although the door was locked <clears throat> jesus came and stood among them and said peace be with you then he said to thomas put your finger here and see my hands and put your hand and put out your hand and place it in my side do not disbelieve but believe thomas answered him my lord and my god and i love this because it gives us an incredible amount of hope uh, thomas does get a bad rap you know, we call him doubting thomas but he makes an incredible profession. I don't know if this is the point where he becomes a believer or not, but I think it may be. We might be witnessing Thomas's conversion because at this moment he recognizes Jesus as Lord of everything. He recognizes Jesus as the one who created all of reality. 
my Lord. And in the original sentence structure, it says, my God to me. He recognizes in that moment as well that he has a God. Jesus is his Lord, and he is the one who's going to rule over him. He's the one who's going to save him. He's the one that he's always known from his youth as the creator. You know, he brings all of these things together in this moment and in this statement. And this concept of, of being kept safe can only be accomplished, can only be accomplished by making that realization, by confessing that with our mouths, that he is our Lord, he is our God. And if we are to be kept safe, the only way that is accomplished is by believing. And if we are to believe, if you have believed this morning, then you are in a position and in a relationship to begin to bring the gospel of peace to the world around you. But the realization has to be, I have to set apart the Lord Jesus. I have to set apart Jesus as Lord in my heart. I have to make that confession day by day that he is my Lord and my God. And we begin to see when that setting apart of Jesus as Lord takes place, the mission begins to be fulfilled. The, the opportunities in our lives begin to unfold and we see God doing things that we never would have expected and we could never accomplish on our own. Now, Paul says to the Ephesians, he says, <clears throat> he doesn't just leave it at, you know, the, uh, here are the different pieces, you know, and which just an incredible, incredible piece of, of um, just an incredible picture and, and metaphor for us, this whole armor picture. But then he moves on to say, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me. You'd think that a guy who has just told them, here's the armor of God, here's what God does for you, here's how he protects you, and here's how he arms you for the mission that he's sent you on. He says, but pray also for me that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. He's asking for those prayers. He's asking for them to war with him in the spiritual, to war with him to accomplish what God has, the mission he's put them on, him on. And so there's a partnership here. You know, and while each one of us needs to set Jesus apart as Lord and God, we are also partnered with one another. And that community that we heard about last week and we'll continue to hear about, that unity that comes by the Holy Spirit as Jesus is proclaiming this and he's, he's letting us in on this conversation with the Father. He's letting us know his intentions. He wants to bring us together so that we individually set Jesus apart as Lord but that we also, as a community, set Jesus apart as Lord. And that's the distinguishing factor for any believer in Jesus and any community of believers. It's Jesus. So I encourage you, be like Thomas. You, you probably have had moments of doubt. But when Jesus kindly comes and shows you through his word, by his Holy Spirit, through other believers. That's the moment to just proclaim his lordship and his sovereignty over your life, that he is Lord, that he is God, and he rules all things. And you'll see God accomplish incredible things 
in your own life and in your own character <clears throat> and in your own mind. So set Jesus apart and he's going to change you. I promise. Lord God, I thank you that I can testify to your truth, Lord, that, that you have all of the best ideas, Lord, that you have created and you are in the process of recreating, Lord, through your church. And one day, Lord, we will see um, you just redeem all things. Lord, these are your promises, and so, Lord, we, we stand on those. Lord, there are so many ways that, that we, Lord, we come to a place where we ignore you. Lord, where we um, just don't fully believe the promises. But, Lord, you are gentle and you're faithful, and you're patient, and you constantly remind us. So, Lord, I pray that today, Lord, this reminder would be the catalyst, Lord, for us to, to set you apart. Lord, that we would, we would just seek to know your mind through your word. Lord, that we would listen to the Holy Spirit, that we would pray for each other and pray with one another. God, that we would speak about your truths and your promises. Lord, that as a community, we would set you apart as Lord. God, I pray that uh, you would just do a work in each of our hearts, Lord, <clears throat> to make us ready. Lord, you wanted us to stay here in this world. You wanted us to stay here, Lord, in, in the midst of the battle. So God, I pray that you would uh, open our eyes um, help us to understand, Lord, where we need to, to point ourselves, Lord, individually, where we need to point ourselves as, as a church, where we need to point ourselves as a community of believers. God, that we would really hear and see you working, and, and Lord, we would um, just get behind what you're doing. God, I pray that today um, that each one of us uh, would just receive from you Lord, a, um, just a little insight, Lord, just to hear from, from you speaking to the Father. And God, that we would be uh, spurred on, Lord, that we would be encouraged, uh, Lord, that we'd be challenged, and Lord, that most of all, we would come to the place where we would make the confession that you are Lord and that you are God. And we ask all this in Jesus' name, amen.